All right. Recording. Hello, everybody. My name is Puck Curtis, and I am one of the two uh, fencing masters who runs the Sacramento Sword School. And during the pandemic, uh, we are hosting a virtual lecture series called the Distressa Lecture Series. And today, our host returning for a Fabris versus Thibaut deathmatch extravaganza is Michael Haveron. And he has provi kindly provided me a bio that I can read, which is different from the one that I published uh, to promote the event. So I haven't read this yet, but I'll just work my way through it. And pardon me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, it says here, Michael is a martial artist from Seattle who is best known for his Grammy nominated lecture in this very series. What? His lecture has been described as at times poignant, joyful, and terrifying. Michael's lecture is an altogether brilliant movie and the debut of an equally brilliant director. Michael is an entrepreneur, a noted philanthropist, and my personal best friend. Men want to be him. Women also want to be him because he has broad appeal across all demographics. He didn't know I was going to say this because I'm writing this all on my own, but I now consider him to be the Le LeBron James of swordsmanship or maybe a cross between LeBron and Mozart, if that's a thing. Okay. Uh, so with that, we will turn it over to Michael, the LeBron James of swordsmanship. Thank you, Puck. It's an honor just to be nominated. All right, when last we met our heroes, we were discussing two big names of 17th century swordsmanship, Salvatore Fabris and Gerard Thibault. So uh, let's get back on the back on the wagon. In the last talk uh, in this series, I shared some ideas about uh, how Fabrician swordsmanship has multiple modes and how we can use those modes to talk about Thibaut. Uh, we can understand what Thibaut does do, what he doesn't do. Today we're going to continue talking about them. Now, if you're watching this later on. Uh, and you'd like some, some more context and introduction, you can check out my last talk and you can also talk, uh, you can check out Matthew Howden's second lecture in this series, which is a general introduction to Thibaut and his art. Now, since those uh, resources are already available, they cover some of the basics, we're gonna jump right in. And afterward, if you have any general questions about Fabris or Thibaut, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, but this time we're gonna talk about something a little more specific. We're gonna talk about one specific chapter, Thibaut's chapter 33, which is called On the Postures of Salvatore Fabris, which is here. Okay. Uh, quick logistic question. Do I need to be spotlighted here? I'm not seeing myself as the, I'm seeing Puck highlighted here. I want to make sure everyone can see this. This is a picture of the cover page, uh, the introductory page of chapter 33. Can people see that? Let me get, give me a little feedback here. Good. I can okay. see it. Yeah. Yeah. I can see. I think people set their own layout. Got it. Got so it. Sounds you good. probably want to stack. Okay. So, um, as far as, um, by the way, if you have the books, uh, it might be handy to read along. So we're going to talk about that one chapter. This chapter, by the way, uh, this is um, a very unusual thing. It's an entire chapter dedicated to dealing with Fabrician postures, which is really interesting. Um, let's get a little perspective. How unusual is this? It's not uncommon for masters to comment on each other. Usually, though, you just see it as one, one or two sentences. Sometimes you'll see an illustration. Uh, Thibault gives us an entire chapter with 14 illustrations. Uh, let me see if I can't give you a, an idea of what the entire thing looks like. Okay. Here's, here's what the illustration looks like as a whole. It's very large, uh, 14, 14 diagrams. Uh, on one large page. If you haven't seen the book, this is the size of, uh, it's larger than a coffee table book. It, you would have, it would actually fill up about a coffee table. This chapter, and there's many text pages that follows. This chapter is, I would say it's more detailed than a lot of martial arts books are in their entirety. So yeah, this is unprecedented. 
And when, when people find out about this chapter, um, they tend to be really curious. Okay, that being said, it is not so weird for Thibaut. Thibaut has a, an enormous book. He's got 44 chapters in the book. It's huge. Uh, it's about 500 pages, and the pages themselves are big. Well, I actually don't know how many pages it is. It, it's about 500 in my facsimile, but those pages are smaller. He dedicates lots of his chapters to dealing with uh, unorthodox tactics, tactics he considers unorthodox, postures, other weapon combinations. So maybe it's less surprising that Thibault is the one providing this. It's also less surprising that he's talking about Fabris of all people. Salvatore Fabris gets name-checked a lot. Uh, I found his name in maybe a dozen books. That, that's quite a bit. And the most common thing that people say about him is how well-known he was. So it seems like Fabris had a reputation for having a reputation. I would say he's certainly the most famous Italian swordsman of his century. And if we include... So the most favorite, famous Italian swordsman. If we include all of Europe, I think you have to think about Pacheco, right, as competition. But specifically Italian, Fabris gets mentioned quite a bit more. So the chapter is highly unusual, but everything about Thibault's book is, is highly unusual. And if he's going to target anyone for criticism, it makes a certain amount of sense that he decides to target Fabris. Now, I wanted to talk about this because people are really curious about this chapter when they talk to me about Thibault. Everyone who, who sees it seems to express some amount of intrigue. They think, oh, that's fun. But a lot of people feel like they can't understand what's going on they find his book impenetrable. And on top of that, not that many people have practiced Thibault's system, not that many people have practiced Fabris' system, uh, very few people have practiced both. Now, I am not an expert, but I have practiced both systems, and I think I've spent enough time that I can at least help walk you along and maybe lead, lead you to a few conclusions, and then maybe uh, send you off with the ability to find some more. And plus, maybe we can put some questions to bed. Um, also, because I practice both systems, I want to do this in a careful way. I want to make sure that we are true to both sides here. Uh, and I am personally unsatisfied by the way I see a lot of, um, the way that I see people talk about critiques across systems. People usually take a side. They're, they're usually not very critical and they sort of make a joke out of it. Uh, because at the time, a lot of people, a lot of people at this time, We got an echo going on here. A lot of people at that time were highly partisan, but we shouldn't imitate that. But it's a really tricky thing. It's an important thing to learn how to navigate between different martial arts. And especially when you are trying to learn something new and different, but you're not throwing away everything that you already know as soon as something contradicts it on a surface level. So it's really important uh, to me that we synthesize what we learn. We don't replace what we learn. Okay, so when we look at a chapter like this, we have, we have to think about what are we going to learn? And more importantly, what are we not going to learn? Because we're not going to learn how to defeat Salvatore Fabris personally. This is not a manual for, for murdering a man, a specific man, although wouldn't it be fun if it was? Uh, on top of that, there's no general solution to Fabris' system here. It's not going to be a general solution. You might think it is, it is not. We will not be able to determine which system is better Thibault's going to make a case for his system, of course, uh, but I don't think we can determine that from this chapter. We cannot tell also what Fabris would do in this situation, but in that, I'm going to try to fill in the gaps for you. That being said, we don't know how Thibault would respond to the, the way that Fabris would fill in those gaps, but we can have a discussion about it. And this is going to be, I think this is a topic where uh, there's really fertile ground for question and answer as we go and after the fact. So please feel free to ask away. Now let's talk about how to read it. This chapter has, as I mentioned, 14 diagrams on this page alone. I'll zoom in just so you can see one of them a little bit better. These are called circles, although really they're inscribed within squares. Each one of these circles uh, represents part of a play, and each play takes place over several circles. There's 14 of the circles, but there's only about nine plays. And many of the circles come up over and over again. In each play, 
there are always the same two swordsmen, Alexander and Zachary. I'm going to draw a point to him here. Alexander on the right, he starts at point A because his name starts with A. Zachary on the left, he starts at point Z because his name starts with Z. And Alexander, the guy on the right, is always representing Thibaut's ideal. Now, if you have trouble remembering who's who, uh, you can just think Alexander the Great because Alexander is a great example. Now, in this case, uh, this chapter, Zachary, here he's the Fabrician. He's in a somewhat Fabrician posture. Well, it is Fabrician, it's just not very low, but that's fine. It's within the margin. And we're going to we're going to see them take turns winning. If you look closely, you'll see occasionally, for example, uh, top right here, we can see Zachary's winning. Sometimes he's going to win. They're going to take turns. Uh, Alexander is going to show what he wants to do. Zachary's going to beat him. And then Alexander's going to fix what he does. Counter versus counter and so on. Okay. Let's go on to the place. I'm going to throw a wrench in the mix right away. We're going to skip the first one and come back to it. Because, uh, and if you have the book uh, at home, you may, you may notice there's a, it starts at a weird point. The second play tells us what happens if Zachary does nothing. And I think that's a good place to start. So, uh, we're going to start with circles one and two, and we're going to end up on circle four. Okay, let me show you a little bit nicer image. This is one I took. Okay, so we're going to go from circle one to circle two. Circle two, it's hard to see. It's in the background. By the way, if you're not familiar with this book, these circles go in effectively random order on the page. They're not well arranged. But in this case, one is in the foreground, two is in the background, they're both in the bottom right. Uh, oh, excuse me, that is chapter 31. It's almost the same. We're going to go here and here. Chapter 31 also has a Fabrician in it, but he's not doing anything fancy. Okay. In circle one, Alexander's going to show us how to enter into measure cautiously. He's going to sneak his left foot into measure. But as we can see, his weight's not on it yet. If you draw a line from his head to his shoulders to his hips, you can see his weight is not yet forward. Right? He's keeping his weight back. But he's putting his sword forward. He's putting his sword fairly low. You can see his point is underneath Zachary's blade. That he's allowing for the possibility that Zachary might chase it. Alexander sneaks his left foot forward he's, before he puts his weight on it. And he doesn't try to gain control right away. And then he shifts his weight onto this foot, which we can see in the back. That's what it looks like when he shifts his foot. And as he shifts his foot, the right foot raises up and it's going to pass forward. Uh, I'm belaboring this point a little bit because we're going, this is going to be repeated in literally every play for the rest of the chapter. So it's good that we get this now. Alexander is going to step forward and subject Zachary's sword on the inside line. You can see it in the, in the back here. And he's going to pause or slow down in the middle of his step. Let's talk about what's happening with the blade first. If you are not familiar with subjection, subjection is uh, very, it's equivalent to taking an atajo in Destreza or finding a blade in the Italian tradition. It's not necessarily the same shape as, you would, uh, as other masters would use, but it's the same idea. It usually means placing your blade above and across the opponent's blade with greater degrees of strength as usual. Uh, Thibaut happens to like to make blade contact when he subjects, but he does not have to. And you can see that he is out of presence, pointing above Zachary's head. I have a question oh, about this. Oh, yeah. In this, uh, <laughs> in this image, he's taking um, the, the very weak on the very strong of his blade. Is that sort of a norm? Uh, it, is, uh, it is normal for this range. Okay. However, um, Thibaut's all about proportion. He'll he'll say that you know if at a, the the same idea at a closer range would be at a different point in the blade, and he needs to um, needs to earn the ability to go further down. Obviously, uh, Zachary, there's a chance that Zachary's going to change lines on him. But a key point here is when Zachary's blade, once it gets 
past the quillins, maybe about here, it's a lot harder for Zachary to change lines because that's what quillins are for. Also, if you're not familiar with Thibault's uh, grip, it does hold the quillins at a slightly different angle. Uh, but yes, and, and Thibault is usually extremely, uh, when I say usually, he is extremely precise about which part of blade goes on what part of blade. He actually numbers them from 1 to 12 so, so that he can give you within a 12th what point on on the blade he wants. In this case, yeah, it's, it's very, very uh, deep on his own blade and shallow on Zachary's. But you'll see that he doesn't really like an intermediary position that much. In this specific case, he's going right for the hilt. He's not really doing much in between. So the movement of the blade seems um, relatively large. Just on the close-up, it doesn't look to me, well, the hand position is changing by 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, according to the cross of the weapon. Um, but the adversary is remaining fixed, so it feels like um, we're generating a tempo. The tempo of the feet looks pretty quick, but tempo, that blade action seems uh, rather large for uh, the opportunity presented to the adversary. Right, so we can think about like what, what the point is doing. So if I'm starting from here, which is in circle one, and I'm raising up about this far, that's essentially the motion we're doing, but the hilt itself maybe only moves like this far, right? So it is, uh, his week is creating a, you know, it is a tempo, it's not a large tempo. So he's moving his weak, but the, the strong doesn't move very much. Okay. That doesn't mean it's not something Flabbers would, would seize upon. Flabbers would also say, say that not only has this point raised so high, it's also raised out of presence. And look at this position that Zachary is in. He's hinging at the hip, and he can very easily hinge a little more. Right? He can easily drop his head, in which point, if he drops his head while Alexander is raising his point, that accentuates the height differential between his head and his opponent's point, he can get under this thing. And that's in, that would be uh, something Fabris is extremely likely to do. And to Thibault's credit, he does devote a play to it. Okay, thanks. That being said, um, you know, this Zachary is um, at a distance where he, uh, he really needs to cue off the feet. So Alexander's going to sneak into measure here. He's going to subject as he does. He puts his uh, his hand forward, he's going to subject, and he starts his pass. And what's going to happen with his feet is really interesting. The timing is, is important here. Alexander's weight is on his left foot, his right foot is in the air, and he's gradually bringing it forward until he falls off balance forward. This is the most important technique in this chapter from Thibault's perspective. Now, what happens then? Well, now we're going to go on to circle number four, which shows what happens if um, everything goes according to plan for Alexander, uh, uh, Alexander. This one is a little bit smaller because it's in the background. Look at circle number four here. And that pass of the right foot ends up forward and he delivers a, Alexander delivers a direct thrust on the inside line to the head. Nothing fancy here. Uh, the feet are going to step a little, the uh, front foot steps a little to the left, to Alexander's left, uh, and the back foot is going to compass around just a little bit, just to give a little bit more uh, profiling with respect to Zachary's sword. And the reasons why this work are pretty familiar. I don't think we need to belabor this point for the most part. Alexander, he takes control uh, of the center before he puts his body in harm's way. He pauses briefly, and then he steps towards the opponent's blade to in, so as in not just forward, but a little bit across the line, so that he increases the pressure on Alexander's blade. But he does so without this action. You notice that his, his hilt has been very stationary with respect to his body. He's willing to move his body to move his hilt, but he's very rarely at this range willing to move his hilt with respect to his body. Uh, and more importantly, Alexander is, is acting first at long range, uh, which is a challenge, right? Uh, 
Moving first at long range means that the opponent has a lot of time to deal with you, to reorganize their body, to put their sword somewhere else, to take a step back, to do whatever they want. That puts him in danger, so he does this thing that I characterize as moving both ways, uh, excuse me, looking both ways before he crosses the street. And, you know, carefully entering into measure. Uh, he describes it as pausing. I don't know that I would, I think it's more of a slowing down than an actual stop. And he's certainly not waiting. He's not going there and then waiting for Zachary to move. And if he did, he, he couldn't do the strike because this action shows what happens if Zachary does nothing. Now, from a Fabrician perspective, so for each one of these plays, I want to I ask, what would Falgris do? What would he think? Would he approve of Zachary? Would he approve of Alexander? Is there something else we should be thinking about? Obviously, in this case, <laughs> Zachary does nothing. Fabers would have him do just about anything else. Uh, but most obviously, Zachary should contest the center. You don't you don't give this away for free, right? Th this uh, this opponent coming in to take your blade, you don't give him that for free. A as as Puck mentioned, there is a tempo here. It's maybe not uh, the biggest tempo, but you can at least use it to free your sword. Uh, so Alexander, I mean, Alexander is putting his weak forward. Zachary can try to constrain it. That being said, on the other side, Fabers would actually approve of what Alexander is doing. I mean, this pause would be strange for Fabers, but uh, not much to object to here. So actually, we're going to see that in a lot of these plays, Fabers is actually going to agree with Tabo. Okay, let's look at play one. That was play two. Let's look at play number one, because now we're going to give Zachary something to do, nothing too fancy. This one, depending on how you interpret it, is the dumbest thing that Zachary does, probably, or it's actually quite reasonable, and I prefer the second interpretation. So uh, it's going to start in exactly the same way. Circles one and two, Alexander enters safely. He subjects on the inside. Alexander begins his pass, but he pauses with his foot in the air, as we talked about. Now, Zachary doesn't recognize that that is a problem for him. He's going to lunge with a direct thrust on the inside line. We're going to see it in circle number three. Zachary takes this big step forward. He tries to attack, and of course, Alexander simply intercepts it with a thrust of his own on the inside line, finishing his step here, which in this case slightly went to the right, whereas previously it went to the left. Uh, that's not critical, but he does make a note of it. Uh, however, what you see, and actually mm, circle three is not the moment that he strikes Zachary's face, this is the moment after. He actually lets Zachary walk onto his point, and then he finishes the step. Alexander finishes the step after his point is already in Zachary's head, because that's that Tabo life. You've got to execute with rigor, put your point in someone, and then take a step. Uh, he's he's brutal, man. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that is about uh, the question of how you get out again, right? If you put your point in someone, then you back out. What, do you think they're not going to take a shot on the way out? They don't disappear, right? So instead, putting your blade in them helps pin their weapon to their body. And as Tabo says... Eliminates the possibility of revenge. Okay, let's talk about why this works. Again, I think I think anybody who's who's worked with a rapier knows some version of this action. So let's just focus on the part that is interesting, which is the pause. So Alexander, he he takes control of that center. This is this is showing why we're pausing. The previous action, the pause was didn't function because Zachary did nothing. But here we're showing why we're pausing. Because right as you step into measure, that's a moment where you can be struck. It's a very dangerous place to be because you're starting your step from a position where you can't really hit the other guy, but you're ending in a point where you can be struck. And, you know, you're already, you're busy moving. But so Alexander, as he does, he briefly interrupts the rhythm of that key moment of vulnerability. He does not wait for Zachary to attack. He doesn't intentionally present an opening. This is not an invitation. He's just carefully looking both ways before he crosses the street. And the key point is, um, the, the, the key thing he's looking for is the, the point of Zachary's sword needs to come to about the midpoint of 
excuse me, the, the point of Alexander's sword needs to reach Zachary's arm. Once it's about that far deep, we call this second instance. Once it's about that far deep, Alexander's just going to go. Uh, so at the, so in this case, you can, you can argue that Alexander sort of has second mover advantage, even though he starts moving first, he is still committing. Zachary is over committing first. And at this distance, he's got plenty of time to turn his hand. No problem there. Zachary, on the other hand, he's going to misread the situation. He thinks that Alexander's taking this long attack from, from first instance, he's going to take this big, long attack. He's going to commit straight to it. Either that, or he thinks that, oh, this guy, Alexander, he's not going to react as I do this. Okay, so obviously Fabris wouldn't approve of, if if you have, if your blade is, is controlled, obviously you don't attack in that line. Fabris wouldn't approve of that. Um, but actually the main thing here is timing. Zachary needs to cross this really long distance, and if, if Alexander isn't moving, isn't really committed forward, you need a larger opening to cross that same distance. So Alexander has a very long window of time to play with. Whereas if Zachary simply waited for Alexander to cross that distance, he'd be in a better situation. I do want to address here that this is not necessarily as dumb as it looks for Zachary. I've done this. And um, if you very slightly do this improperly, or if you, Alexander's action, or depending on the way their time works, Zachary actually does have a couple of different possible openings here. The first, of course, Puck already called out, which is that as, as the guy's point raise, as Alexander's point goes up, that is a moment where Zachary can, try, can raise his own blade, strike through the death leg, which is still a timing problem, but it's not like a closed line, right? He's still, he's not striking to a closed line. He just has a, but it's still out of tempo in a sense that like Alexander still has time where he could, he, he could react. So as a Fabrician there, you would expect maybe don't take that shot simply because it's very likely he's going to defend, but it's not as if you don't have something. That's if, um, th that's one possibility. You know, what you're afraid of is that Alexander does a good job of subjecting really early and then he steps. But if his subjection is just a little bit late, it's not crazy to contest this line. Uh, Another thing that Fabris likes to do, which is relevant here, uh, he doesn't have a name for this tactic, so all I have is the description. As someone reaches for your, your blade, uh, actually, I'll show it on the diagram. It's, it's, so let, let's uh, key in on something that Eric said. He's reaching for Zachary's blade here, and he expects to hit the uh, what Thibault would call the one or two the 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 double weak what some people would say it's the very the very end of the sword one thing that faber sometimes do and does is right as someone reaches for his sword he extends it forward so now the point of contact is maybe on the mid blade and yet they've already committed to that line now you might say well he's still fine right hilt on mid blade sure but if you then combine that with also pointing upward suddenly they're even or even slightly better than even. Fabris doesn't have a name for that, but it, but I just think of it as reaching into the line. Uh, and it's actually not so different from Thibault's counter subjection. It is different, but it's not crazy different. Now, if Alexander's really late to subject, this is th this is great, except that Alexander has still has enough time to defend if you're crossing all that distance. Okay, uh, let's talk about, you know, what else could Fab could Zachary do here? Uh, I mentioned extending forward on the same line to get greater degrees of strength. If you did that, you would expect that Thibault would then, excuse me, Alexander would then, because he has time, he would then counter-subject. Counter-subjecting means raising your point, pushing over, over and across and forward, and just close that line, kind of like a parry, right? With a little bit more of a... Um, offensive mind to it so he's taking the line back and when that happens 100 percent of the time Fabrice is going to do a cavazione di tempo which is changing lines in that moment and because it's an obedience uh he would do so likely with as little blade contact as he can get away with so reach forward then change lines 
This particular Zachary seems unable to master the technique of the cavazione. <laughs> he does not seem to be aware of it. That's okay. Also, just the cavazione is available as, as a first option. As someone reaches for it, you can do a cavazione. One thing that is a little bit hard to do in this situation is, I mean, it's hard to do a cavazione if a guy's hand isn't moving laterally at all with respect to his body. You can, of course. It'd be a lot better if this subjection were actually moving across his own, his own chest. But when he's doing it with his entire body, it's a little bit less attractive of, of an option. But yeah, what would happen then, you know, if Zachary does take advantage of the center, he would take, excuse me, he would take advantage of Alexander's play coming to the center. Now he's got control. What would he do? Again, he doesn't have the tempo to cross that space. So you take a step forward. And despite, a lot of people think that Italians like to attack from very long ways away. Kind of. They like to counterattack from a long ways away. But if they are taking the initiative, most of them will come to a shorter range. And certainly Fabris. Uh, so he would probably try to take control, then approach to Misura Stretta and strike. Misura Stretta, one step closer to Misura Larga. Uh, so those terms mean Misura Larga is wide measure, Misura Stretta is narrow measure. We don't need to get into too many details there, but he's coming closer. As far as Alexander's action, yeah, Bravo likes it. He takes control at range. He has a good tempo to attack. He attacks and defends simultaneously. Again, Favich wouldn't necessarily pause like this, but didn't, he wouldn't hate it. Okay, those are the first couple of actions in this section. All pretty simple so far. Main things that I see out of these is that we are starting with an assumption that the Fabrician, Fabrician Zachary doesn't have control of the center. So we, do, we should proceed moving on. Just keep that in mind moving on. In reality, he wouldn't give this away for free. But if you assume, okay, Alexander does take control of the center, what happens then? Then we can get something out of it. Okay, well, let's look at the next two plays. The next two plays are connected because one counters the other. All right, we're going to see Zachary win again. Then we'll see the counter for it. The first thing is uh, in play number three, which is going to be on circles one, two, and five, for those reading along at home. We're going to start, shockingly, with Alexander entering and subjecting on the inside Without me, well, actually, in this case, he is going to immediately pass forward because this Alexander is, uh, I don't want to get technical, but he would be called a schmuck. So he is pausing forward. He is passing forward without pausing. He should have, and he's going to die for it. Zachary is going to parry, and then he's going to hit him at the same time while avoiding his body. And it's going to look like this, which is probably not, excuse me, it's going to look like this, probably not what you had in mind when I said parry, you were probably not thinking of this. It is a weird parry. It is not across his body. He's, it's, it's, uh, this is a tricky one to interpret. He's probably pushing forward and up somehow, which is not a very Fabrician parry. Then he's going to turn his hand around the strike. Excuse me. He's turning his hand around. He's striking around the center. He's turning his hand around, uh, what, He's either an attempted parry on Alexander's part, or he's just shoving Alexander's blade out of the way. This is a thrust around the center. A thrust around the center is meaningful because you don't need to use your sword to defend if you're striking around the center, whether it's angled uh, around the left, around the right, from below, from above. That, that is an extremely offensive idea. And when you do that, you need to defend yourself with something else. In this case, it's this voiding action. Now, you, you might say, how this is a pretty small void. Really, Zachary's just passing his, his left foot and turning his body a little bit. In principle, Fabris would, would like voiding. This is maybe a, a little bit of a conservative void. This is, this is, Thibault could not stand showing a real Fabrician void, I guess. Too large for him. So, if I if I were going to do this I, as Zachary, I'm probably in Guardia Terza, reaching up and forward to parry something like that. 
and then passing and dropping the point in. If you really do this as one, two, it feels better in Prima to me, but I can get it to work. I, I do think there are some interpretive uh, details that are tricky to iron out on this one, but the general principle is, is simple. Uh, Alexander doesn't pause, Zachary parries and strikes either simultaneously or almost simultaneously. And he does so around the center while avoiding his body. Now, Alexander, you can see what he's going to do to counter it immediately to the left in circle number six. This is the counter. So the this isn't just the shape. Alexander is going to pause before he comes in. That gives him time to change shape. So Zachary is going to think, this guy's about to thrust at me. I'm going to jump forward, pass, try this parry and thrust. But he moves before that critical, critical point of Alexander's point reaching the middle of his arm. Zachary goes too early. So Alexander's going to react by turning his sword to intercept the thrust on his hilt. He's turning his inside quillen up. He's going to actually void his rear side slightly. This, there's a little bit of a compass step. This shoulder is backing up, or rather it's curving around. And he's going to strike what he, with what he calls a counter curve thrust. So curve thrust against curve thrust. And this is a weird sort of action because if you're not familiar with uh, Thibaut's grip, you may be wondering, well, how, how in God's name can you get a sword to do that? Well, it's, it's not that hard if, if, uh, if you guys grip. So it's just this, essentially just supinating. You can do this without his grip. It's going to look different. Uh, it's not going to pose up as well uh, because generally generally uh, you can't with a most quote-unquote normal grips you can bring your you can point your flat up with your hand supination but to point your your true edge up with your hand supinated you have to bend your arm to do so you try this at home you can't you can't go past palm up without bending your arm or uh, turning your body in some interesting and exotic way. But for Thibaut, he's got a way of doing it. Uh, so the pause is of course the, the, the foundational thing that works, that, that makes this work. The hand position is um, secondary, right? He could have, he could have responded to this with a different hand position. He could have simply parried and then entered to grapple or, something he struck in the following action something like that but the pause is what kept him safe um <clears throat> yeah so it, when alexander loses it's because he's attacking from long range he doesn't pause to check zachary when zachary loses he's the one moving too early same basic idea now zachary does keep his you know, when he has a timing advantage, he's keeping it by attacking and defending more or less at the same time. And he can do that because he's voiding and thrusting around the center makes it harder to defend. But of course, against an angle thrust, you can do another angle thrust. And it is a little bit tricky to defend against this angle thrust and also attack at the same time. But Alexander manages to do it. Even against this threat that is very wide, Alexander manages to put his hilt on it and the tricky part is also striking at the same time. And part of it is that he uh, needs to re-angle his body a little bit. And of course, the special grip makes this handshape possible. So what happened to Zachary's offhand there? Is he just... Yes. Up? Wouldn't that normally be a little bit yeah. more already? 100%, right? I mean, look, this offhand is right there. It's ready. Fabrish would tell us that offhands are for emergency use only. Okay. I see an emergency. <laughs> this is why, yeah, put your off hand on it. That, that, that's absolutely right, Eric. I mean, not only that, this is a case where I feel like even Thibaut could justify using his offhand. Uh, I mean, he would really tell you is, you know, be good enough that you don't have to. But that being said, if you're in this situation, yeah. And Favre's is not that hesitant to use his offhand. He's only hesitant on over-relying on it. But yeah. Absolutely. So Favre's would disapprove of that part. That being said, the original action when Zachary won, Favre's would, he would quibble with it, but he would generally approve. Zachary's timing is great. Uh, and he protects his body with timing and avoid, and it looks like some amount of blade opposition. It's a little bit hard to tell. Um, 
But you know what's interesting about this? I think Favre would actually do this with less late opposition. He would say, look, if you're going to void and you've got the timing, then that's all you need. It's not that he would poo-poo having extra uh, protection. It's just that if you do it right, you do it right. So let's look really briefly at what, what it might look like if Favre actually were to do this. We've got, a, we've got a couple of images we can look at. Let's say, um, why don't we look at this one? This is a Fabrician plate. So um, if you have, whoops, uh, this is a, a two-stage action. Fabris is, uh, the protagonist is the guy on the left. He is, um, whoops, Fabris is the guy on the left. He is willing to angle around the opponent, and he does so by... Um, by striking around in Secomba. I seem to have uh, made it harder for me to see myself. That's okay. Okay. Uh, we can also see in plate 45 what it might look like. Uh, another similar action. So if... Um, this is a, this is meant to highlight an offhand parry, but the idea is that he's turning his body to void. All right. Uh, so I, I would say the Fabris would commit more strongly to the void. He would turn sharper. He might void low, but we will see that later. Fabris wouldn't parry like this. Um, he would prefer to completely avoid blade contact. He would instead just use the void, just use timing, and have the offhand as a backup. But yeah, he he needs to at least consider using his offhand here. And certainly, if he messes this up, he needs to use his offhand. So Fabris would approve of the tactic that we see. He would not approve of this exact technique. And of course, he would not approve of the second version of Zachary's action, which has all the weirdnesses of the previous play, but now without the critical timing element that made it work. Now, the most obvious alternative for Zachary is to wait half a second and then do something, either the same thing or thrust underneath Zachary's sword to the low line, something like this and he would void his body. But we'll actually see that in the next play. Uh, and yeah, Zachary shoots his offhand, and he would rather contest the center first. As for Alexander, um, I actually, so obviously Alexander's first action, Fabers would not approve. I don't know that Fabers would hate the successful version of Alexander's action. Um, but the grip wouldn't actually allow it. Right, so uh, let's see what we have. Can I bring this up? You know, instead, instead, uh, this is a little bit hard to to show, but Fabris is willing to. If if the opponent, let's say I'm, uh, let's say I'm in maybe a very square seconda, in a, in a very square seconda. If you find and we're on the inside, you find across my blade, you'll be out of presence, which is a problem. So against that sort of threat, Fabris, Fabris is willing to find a cross, come closer, and then kick his hilt out with a punta reversa. And when you think about it, that's kind of like what Alexander's doing here. He's just doing it more upward. Anyway, you'll see that in book two. Okay, um, now that we've got a few plays under our belt, before we do any more, to, this is a fine time for questions if we have them. Just give everyone a moment to process and, and uh, have the opportunity. So if you do have a question, just go ahead and type it in the chat rather than unmuting, and uh, we'll pick it up and run with it. Um, I would notice um, this play from Zachary looks a lot like uh, Agrippa, uh, Book 2, Chapter 6, where he does avoiding action and hooks the arm in an arch. Um, I linked wow. a picture of it uh, in the chat. Yeah, Agrippa has um, a lot of twisting voids. This is what we call his, uh, or what you can call his uh, figure K void. 
uh, he, his figure G void is the inverse. It's going in the other way. Um, you know, Agrippa does a lot of twisting, but he always keeps his right foot forward. So you will see, uh, you'll see quite a bit of that. I mean, one, one difference here is that, um, what Agrippa is doing is more like what Favris would do. It's a little bit less like what Zachary would do. Um, that twist though, and that is going, that is a key element that, you know, if Favris and Agrippa have one thing in common, it's their tendency to twist a little twistiness. I see a question, is Zachary responding to pressure? Uh, not in this case, but he will soon. In this case, um, it is possible that, that Perry comes out early enough that, that he feels it. He certainly doesn't need to, not in this particular case. And if you're a good Fabrician, you're doing everything you can to avoid that. But Zachary is supposed to have parried here. But usually uh, Thibault mentions that. He calls it sentiment. And one of the biggest difference be differences between Thibault and Fabris is their opinion on that. Thibault thinks that anytime you have blade contact, that is useful information. And he can manipulate it to his advantage. Fabris tries to avoid blade contact at almost all times. Except maybe the very last moment when the blade is entering your body, yeah, the hilt's probably going to displace you. Um, one thing that we is easy to see in this action, it looks like, and I'm seeing, uh, I, I saw a question that reminds me of this. It kind of looks like there is a yielding action happening from Zachary. That was my initial read of this, actually, is that he's pairing... Uh, that that actually Alexander's parrying, and in that tempo, uh, Zachary's actually kicking his hand out sort of towards the camera and then angling his point back in. That is a very functional technique. I don't believe it's what's happening here, simply based on what Alexander's doing, because Alexander needs to be pushing across when that happens. That's also the sort of thing that requires long sustained blade contact, which again, uh, Fabris doesn't love because when he gets pushed across like that, yes, he can shoot around. He would rather drop below in most situations. That's actually one thing that I find irritating about Fabris is a lot of times when I want to do these cool yielding actions, he's like, nah, just drop off. You're fine. Go below. Kiss the floor. Okay, let's talk about plays five and six. Five and six uh, show another classic void of the body. All right, so we're going to start off with, this is going to be circles one, two, the beginning of four, and seven. This is, it's going to be like this from now on. Uh, there, there are a lot of circles, particularly the last one. So we're going to see Zachary win. Alexander enters, he subjects on the inside. He doesn't pause because he's a schmuck, and Zachary counterattacks with a low thrust, dropping his point to low line and taking a pass. We're going to take a look at it here. Here is circle number seven, and we can see... Pow, right underneath Alexander's sword, right in the armpit. Look at that schmuck face of his. Yeah, he gets hit and he knows he made the mistake. That is classic Fabrician. Uh, the only thing about it is he's not low enough, but he, he's low enough for what he needs to do. Favris would probably chide him to get a little bit lower. Looks more like how Capoferro would do this. Uh, there is absolutely nothing in the world wrong with this. Fabris would strongly approve of this action. In fact, this might be his first choice. This is easily one of his favorite actions in the world. Uh, here's an example. Let's just look really quickly at an example from Fabris's book. Here's plate eight from his book. Plate eight shows us, uh, this is the same guard from both sides. So we're, this isn't a play, it's just to show you the shape. And then here's uh, plate 40 is one of the times we see it in use. Uh, plate 40 is obviously at a different angle. Uh, however, it is it does start in the same line. Okay, so back to, to Bo. <clears throat> yeah, this is great. Fabris would agree with every part of this, except maybe he might quibble with blade sh the body shape, but sure, no problem. Now, how do we deal with that? Well, you can see over here on the left. 
He's going to drop his hilt. But more importantly, he's going to pause. I hope you see a pattern. When Alexander pauses, he usually wins. But more importantly, uh, right when Zachary drops his point, Alexander's going to drop his hilt. It's already on the way down. It only goes a little bit further, and he's going to keep his blade free and hit him in the face. It is noteworthy here that despite the fact that Alexander's thrust is high, Zachary has not managed to get under it yet. There, it is possible that this thrust is lifting him up a little bit. I'm not really sure. Uh, but yes, there, there had to be a timing problem for him not to get underneath uh, Alexander's thrust right away. There is, however, a little bit of a footwork trick here, because if you look closely, Alexander's further back than he was when he started. He doesn't take a true retreat. What he does is he, uh, his right foot, this is a little bit hard to see, but his right foot was in the air about here. He drops it really close, and then his left foot takes a step back. So he actually drops his left foot back. That helps him angle his body a little bit more, keeps his hip back. Uh, that helps a lot for staying, uh, keeping Zachary in front of Alexander's point. A really critical thing about these voids is they need to get you past the opponent's point. If you can't, they don't work. So why this works should be obvious by now. Zachary's sword stays free. We can consider this, a, you know, Zachary's version, you can still consider this a thrust around the center. It's only barely around the center, but he could have just as soon done it down here. Would have been fine. Uh, well, now, when you void, uh, you can afford to be more offensive, as I mentioned earlier. Zachary is protected by his void when he does this properly. He's protected by timing. He's a little bit protected by the height of his hilt, right? Because uh, it is above his head. It could theoretically help him against certain types of threats, but probably not in practice. And when Alexander wins, it's because he has time to put his hilt in the way. From the Fabrician perspective, uh, obviously we know that Fabrish would strongly approve of Zachary's action. Uh, but as always, when he doesn't work, Fabrish, um would say that he doesn't have a large enough tempo. He does not when disapprove of the general idea, but you can't just throw this out willy-nilly. When Fabrish voids, he makes special effort. He needs to get past the opponent's point. He needs to cross that distance as quickly as possible. And in the, on the left, Zachary has utterly failed to do that. And that, again, that's all timing. And yeah, Alexander's making his life harder by taking a little step back, but that's one of the things that they can do when you attack on long range. Sometimes people step back. So, Michael, I have a question about this. Uh -huh. One of the things that seems to be a, re a repeating theme here is to parry with the cage of the hilt, with the swept hilt itself. And uh, typically, we talk about pairing with the edge, pairing with the flat, and the strong of the blade. I don't see a whole lot about pairing with the cage in other authors. Is that a typical theme that's repeated in Tebow? Hmm. I wouldn't say so. It's... He a lot of times his hilt is in a position you're not used to because of his grip. He, he, he's able to kick it out in slightly different ways. Part of what we're seeing here is, is that um, uh, first of all, these are attacks, these are mostly simultaneous attacks and defenses. And they're against an opponent who is really irritating and who's trying to go around the center. And Thibaut has this problem Rather, Alexander has this problem. How do you hit this guy while he's trying to go around the center? You may have to end up kicking your hilt out, which is not something he prefers to do. But if you get them actually on your hilt, you can kick your hilt. So uh, one thing that, so for Thibault, and this is mechanically true. It's not just a Thibault thing, but I'll just speak to Thibault for a second. Pointing across the blade is important. You don't kick your hilt out, right? you want to have a favorable inclined plane. And I think that's true for, you know, that's true for many authors, but certainly Thibault is using that. So anytime he's kicking his hilt out, you might think, well, someone can force their blade over the top of his. Except when it's actually on the hilt itself. Because then the mechanical advantage is just so dominant that no one, you don't really have that ramp anymore and they're not gonna push your hand around. They would have to have their hand on your hand for that to, to be a problem. 
So he's using the hilt because he he can't cross their blade. If he were to cross the blade in these cases, he would be uh, completely removing himself from any threat. Not that Thibault is all about uh, simultaneous offense and defense, but in this case, when the opponent is is really bearing down on you quickly, as as the Fabrician Zachary is, it's a good idea. Uh, but as a general rule, I wouldn't say that that is a characteristic that Thibault consistently has. It's just the particular threats that we have. So, you know, you can see, for, for example, in circle number eight again, uh, he could have crossed with his blade down below and it, it, on either side, inside or outside, and maybe done some sort of uh, blade parry. But then he, he would have, he would not have struck Zachary. So he now needs to turn that into an attack. But in this case, Alexander's trying to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to keep his point up free of Zachary's hilt, but he also wants the parry, and so he needs to kick his hilt. And he that means he needs to take contact at the hilt, as opposed to simply kicking his his blade down. Kicking his blade, taking com uh, blade contact with a reverse subjection is not going to end well for him. But uh, he's also um, on the outside, right? So I'm talking about Alexander's on the outside of the blade, so he's catching it as... Zachary's blade would be on the way back up, so he's not going to lose um, lose it as he continues to disengage down. He's coming up into it. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, when exactly he catches this? Uh, partially, see, has he done a grip change here? It's possible he did a grip change because of where those quillins are. It, it, we always, he doesn't always call out when he, when it happens. Sometimes Thibault flips his grip, in which case his quillins move about 45 degrees all of a sudden. Um, I will say that there's a million ways of doing this. He could have been on the inside or the outside. You could just suppress down. You can even suppress sort of on the flat side with Thibault's grips just sort of pressing down like this. It's not as bad as it, as it might be with a regular grip. There's a lot of options. I mean, really the main thing is we're, we've got got our hilts in the way, and the quillins are making it hard to change lines again. Uh, and of course, you know, Thavris' answer is just don't make contact when you can. When you have the option, I should say. Um, I should, we should talk about what Thavris would think of this shape. Thavris would disapprove of Alexander's action. In this case, um, Alexander's action, it's successful. Fabris would say this is weak. He doesn't like it. First of all, um, Zachary, he's not making it that hard for Zachary to get past this point because despite the fact that Zachary is really screwed up, that point is very nearly at the top of this guy's head. All he needs to do is drop a couple inches, and now this guy doesn't get hit. Okay? So that's a little bit um, on the edge. And keep in mind that this forward-leaning posture that he's got, it engenders low voids, right? This is the highest low void I've ever seen. He can easily go lower than that, right? So if you see a guy who's got this forward-leaning posture, you should think this guy at least wants to threaten a low void. Particularly these low voids involve hinging the hip forward. Now, although, you know, Fabris would generally like the idea behind Alexander's action, he would not like this angle. This angle that's being created. Alexander is separating his hilt from his head. And he does get away with it. And Thibault would say, yes, that's a, it's not a problem here. And Fabrice would say, yes, it's not a problem here. But in a perfect world, there's this threat to go straight through the dead lane and hit him in the face. Because Thibault, as an Alexander, Alexander is stubbornly unwilling to drop his head. So what would Fabris do? He would take this head, he'd drop it, and he'd keep it behind his hilt. Because for Fabris, you want your head behind your hilt and your hilt behind your debole. In pretty much every situation. There are exceptions, of course. <clears throat> but, you know, why, why would you do that? Well, uh, <laughs> that's, that's because Fabris would be scared of faints, right? What, what, if, what if this action was fainted and then he popped back up the top? Uh, that is, and that's likely what he would recommend for Zachary here. Faint this action, come back up. If if Alexander's timing isn't great, he just drops his hilt for nothing. 
and he drops his hilt in such a way that allowed his devlet to be captured. Tubal would respond that his hilt hasn't gone very far. Right, and his and his devlet basically hasn't moved at all. Right, so it was kind of just this action. Okay, let's move on to the next one. See any questions about that that particular series before we throw a bunch of new information at you? Let's see. <laughs> I saw a, a moment there about a uh, about uh, I saw a question there about a magnifying glass. I have literally taken a magnifying glass to this book. Yeah, the original. You can see the dots. And when you're holding the original, you start looking at the plays, you realize at a certain point, no, I just want to look at the the details, the little like columns and the bits of fabric and the weapons on the walls are just weird. Uh, I, I took some of these images myself, actually, um, including this one, the next one. Okay, now we're looking at circles one, two, nine, and 10. <laughs> because we're going to see Zachary use a backward leaning posture that you see in circle nine as response to his sword being subjected. This is another interesting posture that he's going to use to keep his sword free. And then we're going to see him use yet another posture to avoid while counterattacking. Okay, Zachary wins in this particular case because Alexander's going to step in. He's going to attempt to subject on the inside line. And Alexander's going to take a step backward, lean back, and refuse his sword. Now, now this isn't called out, but that... that uh, foot definitely takes a step back. Alexander, again, he's a schmuck. He takes a step forward. He doesn't recognize. He, he sees that there is an open line here. He's going to take it. Well, the response is right back here in the background. He brings that sword up. Zachary thrusts to the chest, and he voids with a version of what Fabris would call a girata of the left foot. Although this is the most Thibaut looking Jirata I've ever seen in my life. Look at that. Head over shoulders, shoulders over hips, hips over feet. Come on, where's the tip? Should be angled like this. All right, this is this is a great technique. Um yeah. Uh, in in this particular case, I, I gotta say, um it uh this one this one makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh Fabers would love this. But what do we do against it? Turns out there's going to be a few answers to this. Let's take a look at the first. The first is actually the most simple. So uh, the the image itself is actually quite small here because it's circle number eleven. So the which is in the background here, circle eleven. Alexander comes in. He subjects on the inside. Zachary frees his blade down to the ground, leans back, and as he comes forward for that Jadatha, Alexander has paused this time. Zachary takes a big thrust forward. He thinks that Alexander is coming forward. He is not. Thrusts to the chest, does his Jadatha, and Alexander drops his hilt yet again, this time crossing the blade. This is, although the hilt is on, I think we can see he does have the inclined plane relationship that we like, and he strikes Zachary in the, his stupid face. Although in practice, I think this could easily hit the flank. So uh, the way that this works, let's actually uh, go back to the original setup and let's just look at why this worked to begin with. So why this initial action was so attractive to Zachary is because he lost the center, so he just decided to take his ball and go home. He didn't... He's showing that you don't need to control the opponent's sword directly. You just have to know where it's going, which in this case is forward, and you have to not be there, right? Take this passing step out of the way and hit him. Perfectly fine as long as you have the timing. At least it's fine for Fabris. And again, he wouldn't do this as an attack. He'd do this as a counterattack. So it's all very timing specific. Zachary makes it extremely difficult to control his sword by holding it low. He's creating what Fabrish would call a misleading sense of distance. And he's making it so that if 
Alexander does want to control it. He's got to come that much closer. He's got to bring his feet to, well, maybe not there, but almost the center of the circle, what Favre would call Misurastreta, if he wants to approach that uh, and control Zachary's blade the way that Favre thinks it needs to be controlled. That, But that being said, when Alexander does his pause, we know that he does have the time to put his hilt in between his body and the opposing sword. And it's already on the way down, right? It was here moving down and then to continue moving down is not really a problem so and then from alexander's perspective yes zachary is irritatingly hard to control here but as soon as he brings that blade back up he's easy to control again it's coming back through the center so it's a lot easier for alexander to put his hilt on a blade that is right here as opposed to right here so Zachary, in a way, is making it easy on him. So from Fabrician perspective, this first action, circle 9 and 10, great, fantastic, absolutely great. Uh, you know, there's minor issues. Uh, the first issue is that uh, Fabris would rather you not take a step back on this, right? So th this step back is a problem. Fabris uses this in plate 11. Fabris is willing to lean back and drop his sword. In this case, it's Terza. Uh, Zachary isn't in Teresa, but it doesn't matter. He is leaning back. Fabris is not known for leaning back, but he's, he's willing to do it occasionally. Uh, and it frees his sword. He's also, uh, later in the book, he makes it sound like a lot of his opponents were doing something like this. Or rather, I think it's not so much that it's common, it's that it's a problem that needs to be solved. So when you see Zachary do it here, you can see it's a similar idea. It's not exactly the same, but it's functionally the same. Uh, he'll also sometimes refuse his sword high, low, to the side, sometimes across his body. He'll, he's willing to refuse a sword many different ways. Uh, let's see. Uh, book 2, Rule 2 shows a little bit of that. This is uh, an example of refusing your blade. And Fabris loves the void as well, this Jirata. This is more easily one of his favorite voids. He usually pairs it with a lower thrust than this. In Quartha, a thrust by you know, maybe to the chest level. Um, he usually does this while dropping his sword rather than rising, but perfectly fine. Small quibble. Uh, this should not be so static. This should not be something you can stop in. If you can stop in a jot of the left leg, you're probably not doing it in a Fabrician way. This is a passing attack. He would also prefer that his body be a little bit, um, you know, if you take this line of the shoulders and you tilt it like this, maybe not so extreme, but something like that, it will naturally have the effect of lowering the point. So uh, these things go together. So yeah, Fabris might want Zachary to be a little more, a uh, little more static with his feet to begin with, a little less static with his feet at the end. But it's not really causing any problems in this case. Now, as far as Alexander's action, um, obviously no one would approve of Alexander's first thing, but his successful one, his successful one is, um, and that is where he he drops his blade, he drops his hilt in the way in uh, circle 11. This action here, Fabris would not only approve of that, it is in his book. That is Fabris's plate 39. Plate 39 uh, intercepts a thrust by Mesa Cavazione with a uh, jot of the left foot, simply by dropping the hilt on top of it, taking a pass to the left foot. And you can, I'll show you again here. Uh, very normal sort of thing. You're just putting your hilt in the way. Uh, in practice, I can say that doing the Fabrician version is, um, it won't always look exactly like this because it depends very much on where the opponent is targeting on your body. Is it more to the left, more to the right, higher, lower, right? You may not have to cross as strongly as you see in Fabris's version. And so when I look at Thibaut's version, I, th I see this guy, he's doing a version of the same thing. He's not passing with his left foot, but it's fine. It's always going to look a little bit different. Um, by the way, I, I think um, because there's a bit of an angle here, there's also a, a threat of Zachary fainting. Okay. Um, one question, though, is how would Fabris deal with this low guy, right? What, what, we, what would Fabris do if he were in Alexander's position of trying to approach a guy with his sword low? 
Well, we actually know uh, exactly what Favers would do. In book two, rule one, we actually see Favers approach a low blade position and he follows it down. Now, this is against a guy who's not moving, right? So it's important that we understand that if this guy were to raise up with a Jurata or something, he it might end like plate 39 or something, or it might look more like what Alexander does in the book. But but he is entirely willing to um, drop his body low, follow it low to the ground. And again, he wants to low, Fabris wants to lower his body so that he doesn't drop his hilt without lowering his body. Okay, do we have any... This is another fine time for questions because we only have one more play. Yeah, we have a question in the chat there um, from the, the last play there of when does Alexander pause? Yeah, so it's actually really specific, although there is a little bit of room for interpretation. Alexander is pausing with his right foot in the air. So circle number two, uh, this action looks like this. Weight goes on to the left leg, weight comes off the right leg, right leg swings forward and plants on the ground, weight goes on to the right leg. So it happens, it, he's delaying during this point where the, the feet are passing. And he specifically says he, uh, the moment of time is before Alexander's weight falls off balance. Uh, so specifically, you'll see it in, um, it's illustrated. You can think of it as circle number two. You can also think of it as, as maybe just after circle number two. This is something that he actually reiterates many, many times. There is, um, doing this in person, I think it, it does feel a little bit less clear how the exact order of operations go. I mean, I, I do think there are, um, you know, when you when you start moving everything together, it's not just a question of where in the step, but also how does that relate to what your, your sword and your body are doing. So, uh, you know, a lot of people I think would want to take the pause later, right? As the foot comes forward, are you going to set it down or are you going to step forward? I think it's actually earlier than that. But like I said, I don't. I also don't read it as a pause. I think of it as just a slowing down of a step. A slowing down, right? Yeah, I think so. So then, in, in that other play, does he slow down with his um, with his uh, foot again, or is it a continuation in the same place? We're talking about how he goes from plate nine, from circle nine to circle eleven, instead of ending up in circle ten. He does not pause there. Um, well, so what we're seeing here is in in plate nine, he's effectively still in plate two. So, excuse me, in circle nine, he's basically in the same position as he was in circle two. I think his hilt is slightly lower. So he just hasn't committed his foot yet. And so essentially the pause is still ahead of him. So do you think, okay, so do you think that um, Zachary in this case is trying to make use of that pause? Is that what he's... Well, in circle 10, he's, he's, you know, I think in, in the fiction of this action, Zachary's unaware of the, the significance of the pause. If you believe to Bo, Zachary's just acting and he, he's not aware of the, that, he, <laughs> that he, he's sort of an inanimate object. He's going to hit you. He's going to launch at this time regardless. And he, he doesn't really, he isn't keying off the pause. He should be, but he isn't. So when Alexander pauses, Zachary gets hit. When Alexander doesn't pause, uh, Alexander gets hit. If Zachary was reacting to the pause, Alexander would probably always get hit. I'm not sure if that answered the question. Um, anyway, this pause is the number one high level tactical tool that's happening here though. We are seeing in, in every single case uh, where Alexander wins, we see the pause in this chapter. And it's not the only chapter where he where he talks about pausing either. Um, the, uh, let's see, I, I saw a question on there that uh, about whether Alexander is angling his sword 
from right to left on plates two and nine. So I, I have nine here. Uh, it is, in this case, it is possible that he's angling a little to the left. It is likely a little to the left, but it is not necessary. It is only necessary that he be ready to be in that position by the time Alexander, excuse me, by the time Zachary arrives. You don't need to be in the position. You need to be ready to be in the position. As far as in certain plate, excuse me, circle two, uh, yes. Yes, he's aiming a little across by the time he has subjection. And I'm reading that based on earlier uh, chapters, not in this one. If he doesn't, if he comes in without that angle, then Zachary will take the shot and he'll still get hit because he's crossing a long range. He doesn't have the tempo. He has the opening. He doesn't have the tempo. Okay, uh, let's look at the final play. On the final play, we could spend a lot of time on or not. Um, I'm inclined to say, let's focus on the first half of the final play. The final play is spread over six illustrations. And um, it is, the, the key part is early, and then we're going to end up grappling. Now, I don't want to give short shrift to grappling. I'm a big fan of grappling. I think we should all know how to grapple. But that being said, uh, we, it's not necessarily, it's not strictly relevant to what we're talking about right now. So it's going to start the same way. Alexander's going to enter safely and what? Attempt a subject on the inside line and then pause? Yeah, that sounds about right. He, and Zachary doesn't like this. Zachary leans backward. He refuses his sword low. So that brings us back to circle number nine. By the way, this goes circles one, two, nine, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Oh boy. Okay, Zachary refuses his blade low, and then nobody attacks. Hmm, interesting. What happens when nobody attacks? We have to see how would Alexander actually approach this thing, and we see in circle number 12. Circle 12 shows that Alexander puts his right foot down a little to his left. He drops his point to the outside, and the, the hilt mostly stay in the same place. And he touches week to week. Now, the Thibaut does tell us exactly where on each blade. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit if we need to. Keep in mind that at this point, throughout all of this, until or, or at least until they make blade contact, Alexander does not know where the, whether this random Jirata is going to explode out. So he's ready this entire time. He's slowly lowering his hilt in, not knowing whether he's going to need to do the defense from circle number 11. What happens next is a little strange. Zachary's going to say, excuse me, Alexander's going to say, no, 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 don't drop your sword. You meant to be up here and lift. Uh, this is not well illustrated, so we're going to have to make do with this one because the next illustration is going to skip about two steps ahead. All right. Alexander is, is putting his sword underneath and to the outside. He's going to lift this back up and say, no, you did not mean to drop your sword. You meant to be up here on the inside line. So going from outside to inside. Uh, you know, you could compare this to a general, though I, I do think it's different. This is very technically tricky. We can't get into it a ton right now, but one thing that makes this hard is that Thibault is actually clear that Alexander, he says this in the text, this is not, in, there's no, no question, Alexander has a mechanical disadvantage. He has a disadvantage here. So it's not trivial to lift Zachary's blade if he doesn't want to move. So, like I said, we can't get into everything. There is a question of interpretation of how exactly you do this. In my experience, if you do this lift while Zachary is still in the process of dropping his sword, it is far more difficult for him to resist you. So if you do this smoothly out of the previous action and just lift him back up again, it, there, it is a lot easier. That being said, the exact timing is still, I think, ambiguous. So my recommendation if you want to try this is just don't do it as a static action. If you come to here and everybody stops and then you try it, I, I think it's not going to work. I think you're going to need to be flowing out of the previous actions. Uh, I don't think, so, some people would read this as, you know, you have to convince Zachary to lift his own sword, essentially. 
through some uh, element of deception, but that is not a Thibault style idea. All right, what happens when we raise Zachary's blade back up? Well, as you might imagine, Zachary, if nothing happens, then Alexander's going to subject on the inside line and hit him. But instead, Zachary's going to take a little gathering step with his back foot like this, take a nice little gathering step, then he's going to lunge on the inside line. And at which point Alexander's going to parry. And that is where our next illustration picks up. That'll bring us to 13. So we are now in the upper left corner in circle 13. <clears throat> okay, so we saw big lunge forward, big thrust on the inside. Alexander parries across his body, and he puts himself inside the angle created by these two swords. So he is past Zachary's point. His entire body is past the point. Now, a lesser man would use his offhand right away. Alexander's not a lesser man. All right. So as far as this technique, and he's not striking, by the way. This is just the parry. But you, you can see how he could strike. From here on out, everything is just gravy. <laughs> this is not a good situation for Zachary to be in. But I should say, how does this parry come out? Well, the, the thing is that when... Alexander decides to to lift this point, he is loading it with pressure. And this is where he responds to sentiment. He could do this blindfolded. In fact, I'm confident that doing this blindfolded is easier than the lift itself. He feels this attack coming in and then immediately parries. So yeah, actually doing that blindfolded would not be difficult. So the parry is easy. And then from this point, Zachary is really in a bad situation. And we get to 14. Alexander's going to reach across his own arm. Excuse me, his own sword. He's going to reach across his sword, grab a hilt, lift the hilt, pull his sword free down below. Looks something like this. Pair to the inside. Reach across, grab, lift, pull the sword out. We see versions of this uh, elsewhere in Thibault's book. We see it in Thobris's book. We see... This is just a really common grappling action or movement of conclusion, if you prefer. Uh, and from here, Alexander could attack as he like. I mean, a thrust of the body is the most obvious. Uh, we do see examples of what this might look like elsewhere in the book. I can show you really briefly that, uh, for example, chapter 12 has an enormous amount of info on this. If you read across this from right to left, it's all of these bottom circles. That's, that's what's happening. So if we see right here, he, Alexander has entered inside the angle. Alexander reaches across, grabs the hilt. Alexander decides, I'm going to take this thrust to the flank, compass around with the foot, oops, compass around with the foot, and execute with rigor. That is one way this could end. Uh, but this, this grappling sequence or something like it, enter, he calls it entering inside the angle, it's extremely well documented. I mean, look, this is one, two, three, four, five illustrations for the same grapple. And it's not the only time he illustrates it. So very well documented, no questions about what's happening there. But also a bit gratuitous when you think about it because he could have done anything, right? It almost doesn't matter that much. You could just as soon have uh, come to the head or done any number of, he could have entered to throw, all sorts of stuff. Okay, so that um, so let's just talk about the lifting part, dropping a dropping a point and doing the lift, and then relying on sentiment. Fabris would not approve of any part of this. He would hate everything about this. He would hate his blade being pushed around. He would hate pushing the opponent's blade around. This is terrible. Also, Fabris, we know what he would do. He would follow someone down low to the ground. We already saw that. Uh, as far as the grapple, he's fine with it. If you did find yourself in this position. The wide inside parry, yeah, he'd be fine with all of that. So it's really just the lift and the sentiment that is a little bit different. So he wouldn't quite approve of Alexander's action. Um, he certainly wouldn't want to drop his sword so low that the hilt is no longer protecting his head. Because again, people can lure you down there with obedience. 
So Fabris wouldn't mind the tactic as a whole, but he would never, ever in a million years try to lift his opponent's blade or load it with blade pressure. This is the least Fabrician idea of the entire chapter, including the ones that failed. But yeah, the end of the action is fine by Fabris. Okay, I've got um, got some general takeaways, but that's the end of the plays. Let's do, let's um, let's take a moment for questions if you got them. Before we and and uh, from here on out, I think it's just what do we learn from this? Can you talk oh, a little I, bit more about the pause? Mm -hmm. Like in general with Thibaut, what does the pause mean for him? Um, and how does he use that? What's the tactical advantage? I understand that it's a hesitation to kind of get your bearings and make the smarter choice or something like that, but I think there's a lot more to it. So the first thing I want to say about the pauses is that it's not what Favre's would call waiting for a tempo. You're not stopping and then waiting for the opponent to act. I characterize it as looking both ways before you cross the street because when you stop at an intersection, you don't look both ways and then wait until there's a car, right? <laughs> you, you check and then you go. Um, so in that case, in that sense, I want to distinguish it from the tactic of making sure that the opponent is, is coming. He's just checking whether the opponent is coming. I'll share with you an idea that Matthew Howden has. This is his idea, not mine, and I don't know, I don't have an opinion about whether this is right. I'll just throw it out there. Uh, he has told me that he likes to think of this as an action where there's some extra... Where, where Alexander is loading his body with excess tension, he's tensing up his body for a moment, and then doing literally anything else, including relaxing, would cause him to fall, to finish. Now, I think that interpretation is a little bit more like an actual pause rather than a slowing. So I'm not sure if I agree, but that is one idea, is that mechanically he's, uh, he's standing up a little bit on his base leg and lengthening his body through his, his base leg and his uh, torso as a way of breaking himself a little bit. That is one interpretation. Another interpretation is he's just literally taking a slow step. And he's just doing it at, a, um, at a, an important point. And Fabris would do something similar when he approaches. He would never, ever stop when he's using proceeding with resolution, but he would have these moments where he's got, he knows when exactly he needs to look both ways before crossing the street. So, so in, uh, in Italian fencing, we, we talk a lot about, you know, change in tempo as being important. And, uh, and we talk about another fencing too, but like it's explicit in uh, Italian fencing. Do you think that's... Some of what's going on there, he's just trying to not present a constant uh, movement forward, that slight slowing down. I've thought about that, right? Because you, you're starting, you're telegraphing, and then maybe you're interrupting. I don't think that's what he intends. I think you can do it that way. I, I think that is a value of what's happening. Rather, it's a, it's a value of this tactic, kind of like how you can throw a cut and then slow it down and then accelerate it again, depending if your sword is responsive enough. However, there's a deceptive nature to that that I think Thibault wouldn't like, uh, just on an ideological level. Essentially, you know, deception means that you your your action wasn't true enough or it wasn't good enough. You had to to fool the opponent into making a mistake. Ironically, despite the fact that Zachary makes many mistakes here, he, Thibault believes that his art does not rely on the foolishness of his opponent. That's debatable. That being said. Um, I think what you're describing, you know, come at someone fast and break and then finish it or something like that. Um, one of the reasons why I don't love that as an interpretation for the specific set of actions is that we, to really do that well, requires telegraphing in advance of the step. And he's kind of opening with this step. If this were several moments into a fight, I think it makes more sense. You, know, you, do, you do have to prime someone before you break a pattern. But you could use it that way, absolutely. In fact, you do whether you know it or not. I think that's the sort of thing that everybody does intuitively. They establish a pattern, then as soon as they pay attention to a person getting ahead of the pattern, they play with breaking the pattern. I think, I think children would do that. 
I'm curious about the Cavazione di Tempo. We saw a pass under, uh, which I didn't think, uh, maybe maybe the counter to that fills the same uh, theoretical space, but we didn't see a, anything like a, an attack, for example, to the outside cheek with the Cavazione di Tempo uh, that I would have expected there. Yes. This Zachary doesn't seem to like the Cavazione. Uh, I think part of this is that we are giving Alexander the benefit of essentially a free subjection. Believe it or not, I think that might be fair. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I think it might be fair that Zachary's not doing Cavazione to the outside because if you give him a free subjection, Fabris wouldn't love that anyway. Think about this. They both like obedience. The Italian concept of obedience is essentially, when I say the, the Italians don't own it, but just the way the Italians think of obedience is if you set up a situation where the opponent is moving, is doing what you intended them to do, then they are obedient to your will. Thibault has the same idea. He just doesn't use the word obedience. Arguably, it's, it's part of what subjection means is that the next action they do is what you want them to do. Alfieri has this concept where all cavazioni are either in tempo or in obedience, and there's not a third option. So, he does, Zachary doesn't do a cavazione to the other side. But part of it is he may not necessarily have the tempo for it because we're giving Alexander a free subjection. Now, if he did it as the subjection came in, that's a different story. But as, but if he's already subjected essentially at the beginning of this action, just because the choreography gods have dictated it, then I'm not sure that either Fabrice or Tubo would be comfortable doing a cavazione in of subject, a cavazione in obedience. A cavazione in obedience is something that both Fabrice and Tubo would be very scared of doing, unless it came with, say, a step backward. And Fabrice would be more likely to drop, if he's going to do that, he'd more likely void and actually attack with it. So it is unusual that from, from a basic blade handling and perspective and, and, and thinking about like our, what are our tools for Italian swordsmanship, it does seem strange that we don't see really see any changes to the outside line. That being said, yeah, and given the tactical restraints of the situation, or tactical restrictions, I should say, given the, those tactical restrictions, yeah, it, it wouldn't really solve his problems. So we have a question about, uh, this is from Ernesto. He says, would Zachary be less inclined to Cavazione to the outside due to Alexander keeping his further to the right than an Italian fencer's hilt would be? Would he be more likely or be less likely to Cavazione to the outside? Hmm. Well, he's very, very profiled. Arguably, what profiled means that is that he has less inside available, less inside target, but he makes it up with outside. Uh, so I'm not sure that... So theoretically, he has plenty of... out. He has just as much outside line target as he has inside line target, just regardless of where the hilt is. The hilt should be central. I mean, when you're against someone who's fairly square, for example, let's say I'm very square at you. Let's just take the opposite extreme. I wouldn't want to be on the outside. There's no target there. So if I take the opposite extreme and I'm over profiled to the inside, I want to be on the outside. There's lots of target. So Thibault is closer to the latter situation. He's much more profiled than he is square. He's possibly the most profiled of anybody. I mean, he's he turns his front foot in a way that allows him to be more profiled than most are. So I would say that um, being on the outside is not bad at all against Thibault in a vacuum. But that being said, um, uh, he's also standing quite tall. So think about it this way, being outside over the arm against someone who's leaning forward, there's almost like a height disadvantage. Think about this. You're against someone who's, who's a lot taller than you. Just imagine that. Can you hit them over the arm? probably not unless they drop their body a little bit. You can hit them under the arm. But if you're hitting under the arm, inside and outside doesn't matter that much. It's undifferentiated space. It's just low line. So I think that's part of what's happening is we're seeing a height differential based on their starting positions. Because what we're seeing is one guy who's down low and one guy who's standing, to, uh, standing tall. And arguably, Zachary isn't even low enough, right? So Fabrice would be even lower than that. 
So it could just be that we're seeing him attack to the low outside, but the low outside and the low inside are effectively the same in this particular situation. All right, let's talk a, a little bit about what these plays tell us about what Thibault thinks of Fabris, or specifically about Fabrician posture. You'll have uh, more opportunity for questions in a little bit. First, we should acknowledge that this chapter has not been comprehensive. Thibault is only addressing what he considers to be unusual characteristics of Fabrician swordsmanship. For everything else, all the typical stuff, you've got the rest of the book for that. So consider a left-handed uh, opponent. If you're trying to tell someone how to defeat a lefty, you don't need to repeat everything. You just say, here's the stuff that changes for a lefty. So that's what we're seeing for Fabrician postures. You just need to highlight the special challenges that they represent. So we should ask ourselves, what special challenges do Fabrician postures represent? That's the question. Thibault implies that Fabricians are always ready to bail out of a disadvantageous blade relationship. They're always ready to bail out. They drop their points low or they threaten around and they void their bodies. What he doesn't say is that they won't give you that relationship for free. But assuming that they are in a disadvantageous situation, I think that's actually pretty fair. So for Thibault, Fabrician postures present the following problem. I'm Thibault. I can win the center all that I want, and he does believe he can win the center all the time. But I can't prevent my opponent from leaving the center. Zachary can always leave the center. He can abandon it at any time. And because he knows how to avoid, Zachary can still present a threat around the center without control of that space. Now, if you pay attention, most of the postures, the Fabrician postures that are talked about, they're voiding positions, with one exception, which is the leaning back position, which refuses the blade low. These are, these are the postures that we're concerned with. It's, this chapter is about the postures of Salvatore Fabris. So it's not all the other shapes that Fabricians use. It's the ones that enable this threat despite having a disadvantage in the center. So this is the problem that the chapter is trying to solve. It's not trying to solve every threat that Fabris poses because most of those threats are the same threats anyone else poses. It's specifically trying to deal with the threats that voids enable and that refused postures enable. It's about, again, the postures of Salvatore Fabris. So the solution is not too surprising. It's, in broad strokes, A, you should expect your, your Fabrician opponent to do this, right? Go into this thinking, I can't prevent him from leaving the center. Don't try to stop him. Uh, B, at long range, which in this case would be first instance from Resort to Larga, whatever you want to call it. Long range, you need to avoid creating a large enough tempo that the opponent can, can safely strike you on the attack, which would generally happen if you committed to a really long range attack. Next, you need to punish, you need to be able to punish an opponent who does that anyway. Even if you don't give them that option, they might take it anyway, and you need to be able to punish that. And finally, if they don't move, you need a solution for that. If the opponent doesn't move, you need to approach carefully to close range. You need to, you can't really initiate an attack until you're at a fairly close range where the first mover advantage is dominant over the second mover advantage. So this solution is not just for Fabrician postures. It deals with all sorts of sudden reckless attacks. Uh, Thibault would tell you that uh, probably this is how you should fight all of the time, and I think Fabris would agree. Fabris has other tools in his tool belt, but I think he would agree with this. So that is what Fabrician postures represent to Thibault and how he deals with the problem. Now the question is, from the other perspective, should Fabrician students be concerned about this? And this is where... You know, we, we, t we tend to laugh about like, well, if you're a Fabrician, what do you make of all of this stuff? So no, no Fabrician student should not be concerned. For the most part, everything Thibault is using that works generally can be found in Fabrice's book, at least in this chapter. Uh, there's minor exceptions like the whole lifting the blade thing. Fabricians have, it's not that Thibault's stuff doesn't work against Fabricians, it's that Fabricians would use them against Fabricians. That's generally how I view it. 
And of course, there are ways that Favris would make life harder for Thibault. If if this Zachary wasn't Zachary and he was Favris, we would have some changes. Uh, timing would be the big one. Most of the time when Alexander's landing hits, it's because the Fabrician has a bad sense of timing. So if Zachary had proper timing, this would kind of look like Alexander versus Alexander, right? And as we know, perfectly symmetrical violence doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, Fabris would also probably approach some of the time. I mean, we never saw Alexander dealing with an approach. And approaching is kind of uh, something Fabris is famous for. Proceeding with resolution, for example. We never see Zachary approach Alexander. We don't know how we would deal with an uh, approaching Fabrician. And yeah, Fabris is willing to wait for tempo, but he's also very willing to approach and especially proceeding with resolution. And that would make Alexander's job a lot harder. And I think it would really focus on the fight on the, the fight over the center, contesting the center. That's, I think, where it would come down to it. And there's a lot of tools that Fabris would use for contesting the center that we did not see. They both uh, emphasize the center, but Zachary is starting at a disadvantage. So at minimum, he's going to have to work harder than Alexander to win it back. But remember, Salvatore Fabris is just about the last swordsman to let you just let you have control of his sword. I mean, if anything, Thibault would be more likely to. I mean, at least he's got more tools for playing at a disadvantage. He's got obligation. Uh, he, he likes blade contact. Fabris, if you if you establish control over his sword, I mean, you've lost half the battle. So the question that I think is on everyone's mind when they look at this chapter to begin with, and we br brought it up earlier, is, is this fair? Is Thibaut being fair? I imagine everyone here already has an opinion on this. And uh, please feel free to, uh, to throw in what you think. Uh, I'll tell you what I think. I think Thibaut has been accused of being unfair to Fabris by pretty much everyone, that he's taking down straw men. And that would make him completely normal for his time because most inter-system critiques of this time period are neither fair nor thoughtful and not very useful either. And it's true that Zachary's not an ideal Fabrician. He makes a lot of bad decisions. <laughs> he's, yeah, so in that sense, yes, he's a straw man in my opinion. But there are straw men which show that the writer doesn't understand what the conversation is about. And there are straw men which just are being used to make a different kind of point. The straw man in this case does not make me doubt Thibault knew what he was talking about. I think Thibault was being purposeful. Thibault really only really shows the idealized version of Alexander's technique, but what do you expect? Alexander's idealized because he's demonstrating the technique that you're supposed to learn. It's not fair, but that's not the point. Right, the point is for you to learn to bow system. He's not engaged. He's not trying to set up a, a fair comparison. But just because we're not looking at idealized Fabrician swordsmanship, I don't think that's a bad thing. Not necessarily. Zachary does make tactical errors, but those are reasonable errors to make. I could I could see I could expect any one of those errors to actually come up in sparring. So this actually might be an accurate representation of a flawed mortal student. Uh, and I think that's useful information. You could even say if, if you, it could be one little evidence of maybe how Fabricians actually were. Like this is what it looks like to actually practice the system as opposed to being the ideal version in the book. We don't know that. This is just one piece of evidence. But it's, but that's a useful info. I was wondering that same thing. If the more upright stance, the could be inconsistencies uh, added up to that. Yeah, and um, you know we we have to. It could also be that that Thibault, you know, is is missing missing pieces that he doesn't understand stuff. But but yeah, we can just say like, look, when you actually put this into practice, that's what it looks like. And likewise, you can do the same for Thibault. If we had a if we had someone commenting on Thibault, we can say, well, here's what it actually looks like when Alexander's not so perfect. That's useful information. So some of Thibault's claims are undermined, I'd say, by Zachary's errors, like some of his more loftier claims, because Alexander's technique does work because Zachary makes mistakes. 
that being said, I don't think we should dismiss everything that we're seeing here. We don't we don't want to dismiss Tebow's side entirely because, Ale first of all, Alexander makes mistakes too, and he gets hit for it. Uh, and Tebow is actually quite unusual in that. And he shows his protagonist losing. He, he lets his protagonist screw up just to make a point. And the point is, what kind of mistakes matter? So if you want to ignore mistakes, you're going to miss out on that. Because the chapter is about what kind of mistakes are important in this kind of fight. It's all about when you pull the trigger. It's about timing. It's about commitment. And, you know, controlling the center is important, but that's not what this particular chapter is focusing on, right? It's about what sort of mistakes matter. So, yeah, some of us don't want to talk about mistakes. We don't want to think about mistakes, particularly when we're, when we're comparing arts, because we want everything to be fair, we want everything to be idealized and perfect, and that we're taking place, this is taking place in a frictionless plane. But the way I look at it is you should not expect any of your techniques to work without an error from your opponent of some kind. Whether that's forced or unforced. If you define success as not getting hit, then every successful hit requires a mistake. So instead of ignoring the mistakes, I want to view mistake, the, my opponent's mistakes as a result of my technique. So my job is either force their mistake to happen and or make sure that the mistake-free version doesn't happen. So they make a mistake or they can't do it. Of course, uh, I get it as a matter of debate. I understand why we would want to ignore mistakes. And I understand why that's useful for settling arguments about whose system is better, whatever. Um, but I think it, it's telling that Fabris is maybe, Fabris and Thibault are maybe a little bit less invested in that than, than we are. Because as practitioners in 2021, I think some of us kind of just want to play out a fantasy, right? That we, we would rather not, uh, we, we want this sort of be like a superhero showdown. I, I would rather we embrace the mistakes. And that may mean that I don't have as much ammunition in those particular arguments. I might not be able to uh, determine precisely whose dad my dad could beat up. Um, that's okay, I think. I, I think we don't need to advance that particular argument. We will have to summon the strength to go without. All right, that is all I've got to say. Thanks very much for listening. And thanks again to Puck and Eric for hosting me. I'll stick around for questions if you've got them. Um, Anything you like about either systems or how they're compared, thanks for coming. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. That was really uh, fascinating. Uh, if you do have questions, um, go ahead and type them in the chat and we will pick them up and pass them to our speaker. Uh, someone caught the Futurama reference. Thanks, Tim. I wish we had more stuff like this from other other masters in the past. Yeah, hundred um, percent. No, no one is this thorough, but I do think some of the Neapolitan and Spanish comparisons are are pretty noteworthy. Uh, I saw one question: Do you have good drills that you can use for practicing the pauses? Well, uh, you can actually the way that this chapter is structured, you can do. This is just a lesson. Maybe you cut out the last one. You can just do this entire chapter as a lesson. Just build it up. Uh, uh, if you happen to know any classically trained uh, maestri, they would immediately know how to put this together. But if you don't, I'll just give you a simple version. Enter and subject. Zachary either does nothing or he attacks. Okay, once you're comfortable with that, then add in maybe the low void or one of the others. Vary between them. Uh, and then the you'll see the, ver the value of the pause, I think. We tend to see students that um, try to take a Tahoe and step to middle without the pause. And our solution to that is um, to hit them. Yeah, I, I mean, if you're going to do that, I think you need to make sure that your step is pretty small. 
and then you're ready to immediately respond when the opponent tries to hit you. Yeah. So uh, we have somebody that is trying to make a sum up here. It says Tebow wants you to do, wants you to do what when you, oh, it's a question. A Tebow wants you to do what when your opponent's sword is below and unavailable to subject? Well, it depends very much on whether they're holding their blade back at a distance or whether they're actually attacking low. Um, if they're backing up, so if they're li <clears throat> like what we saw in um, circle nine here, uh, you need to approach and then lift them back up. Uh, you need to approach very ca cautiously, covering them. Uh, if they come up and threaten you, you intercept them with your hilt in any way that you like. We saw one version. If they do nothing, you're going to walk up to them, lift their blade up. That being said, uh, a lot of people will have already pulled the trigger. A lot of Zacharies will have pulled the trigger by this point. Fabris would say, instead, we're going to walk our way in. We're gonna, going to put our... He's actually... Fabris would start sort of pointing down, and then he would gradually bring his blade up, and eventually the hilt is down here. The thrust is going up. But the, the main difference is the body position. This head would be, like, down here. If that would... If if uh, Alexander... Alexander was Fabrician. But there... The, it is important that we distinguish that being low and ready to move is very different from being low and already moving in. If the opponent is moving in on you, the general idea is put your hilt on it, and then it, the rest is mostly timing. And, you know, Fabris wouldn't disagree with that. Fabris might be the only guy, though, he who would also consider voiding under the low attack. All right, any additional questions? Uh, I saw one, I'm just scrolling up now. Would it be fair to say that, would, would this book be useful to face people who learn from reading Faber's book as opposed to those who studied under him? That's interesting. Uh, it could be, yeah. Well, because the way I look at it is that if if you learned uh, Fabrician swordsmanship in a way that was too um, was not very timing sensitive, but was very posture sensitive, like if you learned from a series of images, then yeah, that this actually might be good for that. That being said, I know we talked about the mistakes that Zachary may, makes. This Zachary is a little bit better than he should be in certain respects. He's actually quite good physically. Right, there's a lot of mistakes that a Fabrician student would make before they got to this level. Like, if you're making this kind of tiring mistake, you should be making blade handling mistakes or body posture mistakes. That's kind of what I see. Is like this guy's really, really physically good for the sorts of mistakes he's making. All right, I think that's all I've, uh, I see here. Oh, can we see the response to the low? Can we see the response to the low blade is to cross his blade and lift if he doesn't follow with intact, then you bait him with the lift? Let's see, what's that? If he doesn't follow with the attack, you would just finish that spiral to the inside. Uh, I, I briefly mentioned earlier that's a little bit like a general, but not not really. I mean, you know sort of circular. But yes, the um, you could break that down. If I were to, to train that action, I would take out, I would break it down into then from there, we're in a new situation, Zachary may or may not attack. All right, is that it for everyone? I think it is. So uh, what we have left is to thank you very much for all of your uh, time and expertise. I've really appreciated both of these lectures and it was uh, really great of you to do two back to back like this, uh, especially since the first one uh, tied Fabris and Thibault together so well. Um, 
So I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All okay, right. Good, thanks. We do have another speaker lined up, but we haven't nailed down a date yet. And I think uh, based on uh, just things that are happening, we're, we're moving to a monthly cadence for lectures now. Uh, we have requests for you to cover another chapter. Of another Tebow. chapter. You know, I, I, I would, uh, I do this sort of book club thing where we go, we just sort of do this with an entire book and we've been doing it throughout the entire uh, pandemic. Essentially we've gone through like 10 books, but I thought like, I'd love to with two but there are 44 chapters. We did one a week. It'd be like 10 months. Jesus. <laughs> This, this month is the year anniversary of the Distressa Lecture Series, so uh, you could just be the entire year, too. <laughs> I mean, I would get a lot out of it, I'll say that. Yeah, we would I don't do. know that it would make for good YouTube viewing. <laughs> but the content's out there, so people can watch it as they like. All right. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I would uh, ask you to stay safe, and um, the fencing is coming soon. Uh, as soon as we get herd immunity, we're really moving. Uh, so stay safe. Uh, always appreciate having everyone in our lectures. And thank you again, Michael. Thanks, Evan. Thanks.